Welcome back. Today we'll review forces and moments. Force is a vector that represents the action of a body or field such as gravity on another body. Forces being vectors have magnitude and direction. Their units are newtons, which is kilograms meters per second squared. And in three dimensions, the force vector would have three components. So we would write those components traditionally as F equals Fxi plus Fyj plus Fzk, or equivalently F1E1 plus F2E2 plus F3E3, where I, J, and K here, or E1, E2, and E3, are the unit vectors of the Cartesian reference frame. And you'll sometimes see, instead of the little squiggle under the vector, an arrow over the top, or in textbooks, frequently vectors are denoted in bold notations. We will tend to use the notations F1, F2, F3, E1, E2, E3, instead of Fx, Fy, Fz, I, J, K, even though they're completely equivalent, so that we can use the shorthand sigma f i e i and then in continuum mechanics we frequently use the repetition of the subscript to imply the summation and so this is called the summation convention or implied summation so the repetition of the index here implies a sum and uh, the sum would always be from one to three unless otherwise stated so representing our vector again with our three unit vectors of our right-handed Cartesian reference frame. Here's the vector, and here are the three unit vectors, and again the components fx, fy, and fz are equivalent to f1, f2, and f3. fx, fy, fz, or f1, f2, and f3 are the components of the force vector and its magnitude from Pythagoras is the square root of the sum of the squared components fx squared plus fy squared plus fz squared which we could also write as the square root of f dot f. Now you can resolve the components of a force vector along a given direction defined by, for example, a unit vector by using the dot product, which is also known as the scalar product. In general, you could use the dot product to resolve the component of one vector with respect to the axis of another vector. For example, if we want to resolve the x component of the vector f, the force vector f, then we'll take the dot product with i or e1. So here's the unit vector i of the x direction, the unit vector j of the y direction, here's the vector f. We want to resolve this component fx. If the angle theta between f and i, then f dot i would be fx times 1, which is the x component of i, plus fy times 0, which is the y component of i, plus fz times 0, which is the z component of i, would be the magnitude of f times the cosine of theta, which is fx. Forces being vectors add according to the par parallelogram rule for vector addition. So in this example, the sum of P vectors P and Q, if those were forces, would be the vector R, sometimes referred to as the resultant force. And just using vector addition, the components of R will be the sums of the components of P and Q. So R1, E1 plus R2, E2 plus R3, E3 is R, 
where R1 is P1 plus Q1, R2 is P2 plus Q2, and R3 is P3 plus Q3. Now in statics and dynamics, we'll consider forces acting on a rigid body. And we can separate those into the internal forces, the forces that are holding the body together, which should balance out if there are no external forces. And external forces are due to the actions of other bodies or fields. For example, here we have a body sitting on a surface. There's a force, external force F applied to it in the right-handed direction, pulling it along this surface. It has a weight, so that's a force that is acting down on the surface, and there's a reaction force R of the surface pushing back up on the body. And then there's a friction force F that would be opposing motion. Now one thing about a rigid body is that the effect of a force is the same at any point along its line of action. There's no difference. So in other words, a vector's origin doesn't matter. It's just its line of action. So if this is a body with the force vector F acting on it, and this is the line of action, that from a point of view of statics and dynamics is the same problem as if the force vector was acting on this side. Now, we have to keep in mind that if the body is deformable, as it will be when we consider continuum mechanics later, then this statement is no longer true. For example, if we push on a deformable body from either side, it's different from this situation here, where we're pushing and uh, reacting at the same point. Because this situation would tend to deform the body. So that's a little bit about forces. The other quantity that we'll use in statics and dynamics that's very important are moments. When we have opposing forces that are equal and opposite, they balance out. But if their lines of action are different, they create a moment. So a pair of equal and opposite forces shown here as F, and I guess we should call this one minus F, is a couple. And they generate a moment, and we could calculate that moment about the point O here at the center, where D upon 2 is the perpendicular distance between each force and that origin. The moment about a point, such as O, has a magnitude that is equal to the magnitude of the force times the perpendicular distance between the force and the origin. And so we label that M0, and that would be the magnitude of F times D upon 2 plus the magnitude of F times D upon 2. Now notice that even though this F is negative, they both tending to create a rotation in the same direction, so they add. And so we get the magnitude of F times D, which is the same as we would have got had we taken moments about any other point along this line. However, that's the magnitude of the moment. In fact, moment is a vector quantity, and it also has a direction. And its direction is the axis about which it would tend to cause a rotation. So in this problem that we just did, it would be the axis pointing into the page. So to define the moment vector properly about an origin O due to a force vector F, acting at a position that is a vector r from the origin, we have a situation like this. So here's our axis, and here's our origin, here's our body, here's the force vector f acting on the body at the point here, and here's the vector r connecting o to that point of action. The angle that R makes with the line of action of F is theta, 
in a perpendicular distance is d. The moment about O is a vector, and it's defined by the cross product or vector product of F and R. So MO equals R cross F. And if you recall from your vectors days, this will be the magnitude of R times the magnitude of F times the sine of the angle between them, which would be the magnitude of F times D as we got before. And as I mentioned, the direction of the vector is perpendicular to the plane that contains R and F. So in this case, perpendicular to the plane of the page. And you, you define the direction of that perpendicular such that, according to the right-handed rule, the uh, rotation that the moment would produce uh, would be about that axis of the vector. So in this case, the axis is pointing into the page, and a right-handed rule will therefore cause, that moment would therefore cause a uh, clockwise rotation about the origin. Now you might be wondering, since I just told you that the point of action of the force doesn't matter, how I can define the moment in terms of a vector that is, that is defined by the difference between the origin and the point of action of the force. Well, if you think about it, had I changed that point of action, I would have changed the angle. The cross product would have been the same. It's still really the perpendicular distance that matters. So the, the cross product rule for defining the moment works regardless of the point of action because it really only depends on the line of action on the perpendicular distance. So now that's a brief review of forces and moments and uh, how we add vectors and uh, dot products and cross products. So these are some of the things that you may wish to review.